God is a God of love. He's also a holy and just God, and He will not be mocked. Our sins have consequences. The sins of our nation have consequences. So what does the Bible teach about the wrath and judgment of God? That's straight ahead as we continue our study in defense of the goodness of God. That's coming up next as Arkansas Alive starts right now. Thank you for joining me all week long as we have taken up the title of my message this week has been In Defense of the Goodness of God. We've shown you evidence out of the scriptures that God is good and that uh, Job, we, we got into the book of Job and studied that entire book um, and d- uh, disproved some of the concepts and thoughts that people had about Job and about his relationship with God and why how he repented. Yesterday, we talked about the chastening of the Lord, uh, that the correction, the chastening of the Lord doesn't harm you, doesn't hurt you. Uh, God is a spiritual father and he ministers to you spiritually. To chasten means to correct by instruction, not to hurt or harm you. These are things that you need to know. And this is in defense of the goodness of God. Uh, I, I contend with those that try to make God out the villain or are incorrectly informed about God's goodness. I'd like to close out the week with talking about the wrath or judgment of God, because there will be many that will argue, well, what about the wrath? What about the judgment of God? Isn't that in the Bible too? Yes, it is. But I want you to see the difference between in defense of the goodness of God and the wrath and judgment of God. Go over to Genesis chapter one and let's read a very familiar passage of scripture that we read um, many times before. Uh, Genesis 18, verse 17. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that which I do? Seeing Abraham shall sure to become a great and mighty nation. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I know him. He will command his children, his household after him. They'll keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken. Now, what God said to Abraham was he was to be heir of the world and the promise that God made, he made to Abraham. Actually, we know the promise was made to Jesus, but Abraham and God cut covenant. And then Galatians tells us that if we're Christ, we're heirs, uh, we're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Jesus grafts us into this promise that God made to Abraham and the Abrahamic blessing is ours through Christ. Now notice that God said about Abraham, he said, I know him. He and his family will keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that I may bring upon him that which I've spoken of him, which was all good. Your, your, your seed will be as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore and blah, blah, blah. And that all came to pass. It's a fact. It's no longer a promise. It's a fact. It's fulfilled. <clears throat> Even Jesus said when he came, he, he told the, the uh, disciples raised under the law, the old covenant, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And uh, over in Acts 3, 16, 17, I think it says, talking about how the heaven received Christ until the restitution of all things and the refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. It's talking about the second coming of Christ. And he said, and all the things that every prophet has said since the beginning is going to come to pass. All prophecies that the Old Testament prophets prophesied about Jesus, about God, about Israel, because that, that scripture is basically referring to Israel, Acts 3, 16, 17. It's not referring to the church. It's talking about Israel receiving everything that God had prophesied to them that he was going to do for them. And of course, Jesus is in heaven today. He's, he's there, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. And it said the heaven must receive him until this time period comes uh, into play, which it has not yet. Uh, you know that the wrath and judgment of God that is going to be poured out during the great tribulation period, this is a period of time following the rapture of the church, after the rapture of the church, 
Revelation chapter 4, the church is seated with Christ in the heavens. Then the great tribulation period starts. Most of the wrath and judgment that is poured out, and you can read all the seals, the plagues, everything in Revelation, all that is directed towards Israel for their disobedience and rebellion against God, but they shall be saved. The last great day of revival that everybody seems to talk about, but nobody really understands that that great day of revival, there's no earmarks, no scriptures for it uh, to be done until the tribulation period. And we're going to see that in scripture today. So in defense of the goodness of God, let's look at this. If you read on down in Genesis 18, uh, Abraham stood before the Lord and he said before, uh, uh, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is very great, because their sin is very grievous, I'll go down now and see what they've done all, all together according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. Down in verse 25, Abraham says, the judge of all the earth shall do right. Abraham petitioned God, stood in, 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 the, in the gap uh, for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he said, if I can find 50 righteous, 40 righteous, down to 10 righteous, God said, I will not destroy the place for 10's sake. And he could find 10, so the place was destroyed. Now, destruction is not God's DNA. That is not God's nature. So what brought the destruction? God was trying to prevent the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He tried to prevent the destruction of Nineveh. He sent Jonah to preach to them, and he did. And they repented, and God forgave them and did not destroy them. But he did destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin was very grievous. Now, we're going to, we're going to see this played out. This is, a, this is a pattern, if you please, uh, where God is concerned. Go with me now over to um, Proverbs chapter 1, and let's look at verse 24. Proverbs chapter 1, 24. And uh, the, the um, scripture says, because I have called and you refused. Now underline these words when I, when I tell you to. Refuse. Underline the word refused. I have called and you refused. I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Underline no man regarded. You have said it not, all my counsel. Underline said it not. Don't want anything you have to say, God. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. And would none of my reproof. Underline reproof. Now, here's, here's a, a, a people <laughs> uh, and unfortunately he's talking about Israel he says you've refused no man regarded you said it not my counsel you wouldn't have my reproof I will laugh at your calamity I will mock you when your fear cometh when your fear cometh as desolation your destruction cometh as a whirlwind when distress and anguish comes upon you when shall they call upon me, but I will not answer? They shall seek me early, but they'll not find me. Here, here, get this. For they hated knowledge. Underline the word hated. They hated. It didn't say they were ignorant. It said they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They had a choice. They would none of my counsel underlined counsel with none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. This is strong language. They hated. They despised. This is very important to where we're headed. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Notice God's not punishing anybody here. He said they're going to eat of the fruit of their own way. Elvis Presley and Frank Sinatra both sang, I did it my way before they died. That's a terrible epitaph to have. I did it my way. Well, what about doing it God's way? Let's do it God's way. That's the best way. And it said here, they will eat of the fruit of their own way. They're going to get the recompense of the reward for their own way. 
They will be filled with their own devices and the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Prosperity doesn't destroy you. It, uh, it, it only destroys a fool. A fool says there's no God. A fool does things like there is no God. A fool, the Bible says, and Webster's Dictionary confirms, a fool is one without judgment or prudence. They have no judgment. That's why, that's why you wonder to yourself, what in the world are our politicians doing? Are they crazy? No, they're just fools. They're, according to the definition, void of judgment. Listen, I, I didn't mention any names. Listen to this. He goes on and says, <clears throat> um, I, oh, I'm sorry. I want to go to Romans. And he, he picks up here. Romans chapter 1 in verse... Uh, let's see, in verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. It's very frustrating. I see some of our politicians, some of our legislators, I see them very frustrated because they don't understand what this administration is doing. And some of the things that are going on are, are unbelievable. And yet you wonder why are they doing this? Can't they see the destruction, the damage, the long term? No, they can't see. That's the, that's the problem. A fool is void of judgment and prudence. He has no wisdom. He's being motivated. He's being driven. And it says here, they did not like to retain God. And the marginal reference says they did not like to acknowledge God. God then turns them over to a reprobate mind. The marginal reference says a mind void of judgment to do those things which are not convenient. And then he lists them unrighteousness, fornication, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, that's abortion, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And you wonder, why, why do we not have the solutions uh, to our problems? Because we have had our, our, our ability uh, to make proper judgment removed. God said, okay, you don't want me in education. I'll take my hand off of it. We took prayer out of school. The schools have putrefied since then. And it's just gone from bad to worse and worse and worse. That's not a negative confession. That's a fact. And we, our morals, God said, okay, you don't want me in your morality. I'll take my hand off and look where we are now. LBQTGTQ, whatever. Uh, we're, we're drowning. We're self-destruction. <clears throat> we're destroying our, our uh, culture, our children, our, our, our framework as a nation. Mother Teresa said, a nation that kills its unborn destroys its soul. Ronald Reagan said, if you continue to abort babies, kill babies in the womb, you will destroy your conscience. And, and that's what's happened. America's lost its conscience because we've done everything that Proverbs 1 and Romans 1 said not to do. And we've done it willingly. We've done it knowingly. And we are patting ourselves on the back. Look what we've done. Look what we've created. 
And the recompense of our reward is showing up on a daily basis. It's not, the, it's not God. God's not doing any of these things. God's not punishing America. Uh, God's not mad at America. God's not chastening America. America is shooting herself in the foot. America is doing this to herself. But I can tell you why uh, we have failed to stop it is because the American people won't stand up and say enough, no more. No more, we're not going to take this anymore. I mean, we've had revolution. We've had uh, all kinds of wars in our nation since the founding, since the beginning. And you know, after the attack on the White House, what was that, January 6th, they started saying this is the only time in history that there's ever been an in insurrection. It's, that's a lie. It's not either. I had uh, it uh, searched out, and we've had 28, 28 since the founding of this country, 28 insurrections, internal wars, internal insurrections. Why? But people said, no, we're not going to have this. Now, if you, if you think this way, talk this way, and you act this way, you'll be arrested and put in jail because they'll see it as civil disobedience. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. The civil disobedience is not criminal in itself. It's the, it's the citizen standing up and saying, no, no more. We're not going to have this. I'm not talking about a, a, an armed raid on the White House or the, or the Capitol or the governor's mansion or the legislature. I'm not talking about that at all. Why do we keep putting the same people back in office? I was listening to an interview the other day. And they were talking about uh, uh, Governor Cuomo's situation in New York. And he's, you know, always been very rebellious uh, to any kind of uh, assertion authority. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I mean, he's been accused of fraud, manipulating numbers of COVID. He's been accused by several women, uh, sexual impropriety, et cetera. He said, I'm not going anywhere. His own party has has asked him to resign. I'm not resigning. I'm not stepping down. He's the same governor that said, we don't need God. We can take care of this ourselves." He qualifies. No judgment. Reprobate mine. That's not my conviction, my con condemnation. That's what the scripture says. He has a reprobate mind. He's not going anywhere. They're going to try to impeach him. And uh, it, uh, why do we keep putting the same people back in office year after year after year after year? Because the people don't want to stand up. The people don't want to stand up. The people don't want to stand up. The people don't want to say, no, it's enough. No more. We're not having this. The righteous, the people that could stop it, just like in Genesis, don't want to do it. They don't want to get out and vote if it's raining. <laughs> they don't want to stand up because it might cost them something. Well, it's costing us something. It's costing now. But let, let, let's go back to the scriptures. <clears throat> and he, um, he, he plainly says um, in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. And then he deals with homosexuality. In Romans chapter 1, people say, oh, well, we shouldn't talk about that. God talks about it. The Bible is, it, every time you see in the Bible where it said, and they were delivered of an unclean spirit, that's a, that's a spirit of perversion, a sexual perversion spirit. It's, it's all of the things that <clears throat> our government has endorsed. We, we've, we've gone from tolerance to acceptance, and now we're going into, how would I say it, um, celebration. We're requiring it. We're celebrating it. We've gone from tolerance to, of, of perversion to acceptance of perversion, and now we're celebrating perversion. And uh, we're seeing the exact same thing that the Bible says uh, we're going to see. God just gave them over to their vile affections. Women with women, men with men. It says this in the Bible, folks. You don't know it's there. Read Romans chapter 1. 
this was according to the word of God. This was against nature. Against nature. This is against <laughs> nature. I don't know how to, other to say it. Uh, they burn in lust one toward another, blah, blah, blah. And they're receiving in themselves the recompense of error. You, you got to feel sorry for these people. They're ignorant. They're driven. They're possessed. They're having all kinds of problems. And enforcing their viewpoint on the rest of humanity, they think, is going to get them what they're after. But they're not going to be satisfied until they meet Jesus. Jesus is the only person that can help them and deliver them and set them free uh, from their bondage. It's, it's bondage. So he said, God said, you don't like to retain me in my knowledge. I'll give you over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then he lists all the things. So we're in a situation right now. We're here where not only have we, um, you know, uh, faced a, an enemy in the pandemic in 2020 and recovering from that, but now we're heaping more uh, perversion, more, more financial burden, all the things that we're doing to our country. And there are those that say, you know, we're, we're going to reach a point, a tipping point where America can no longer bear all this. America can no longer, um, you know, uh, stand up un, under such uh, perversion and financial pressure. <clears throat> Printing money is not the answer. Other nations have tried that and it broke them bankrupt. All right, let's, let's go to one more particular scripture. I've got about five, a little more than five minutes left. Uh, let's go over to um, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, and I was, I was reading this yesterday, and I just kept going back and forth to make sure that I had a proper understanding. We're talking about in defense of the goodness of God all week long. Correct understanding of the correction of the Lord, why things are the way they are, why things happen. It's not God. God is not, he's not uh, punishing us. He's not uh, correcting us. He's trying to show us. I, I heard someone say, they quoted this scripture over in uh, Hebrews 12. I heard somebody uh, say this, this is another incorrect interpretation, misunderstood, misspeaking. And in uh, Hebrews 12, it says, uh, see you refuse not him that speaketh for, if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape. Talking about Jesus and now, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The next verse, And wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, cannot be moved. Let us have grace wherewith, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God's consuming fire. And, and I heard this the other day that they said, that, and, and they quoted this scripture, verse 28, uh, <clears throat> we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And they said, now God is now shaking the church. God is not shaking the church. It says we've received a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, which cannot be shaken. Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, 18, I am giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So all the trouble and all the problems that are going on, even in the church, is not God's shaking. It is not God's fault. God is not the culprit. God is not bad in defense of the goodness of God. I have to say, uh, properly discern the scriptures. God is not shaking the church. God is not chastening the church. 
God didn't bring a virus or anything else to correct the church. That's not how God operates. Search out the scriptures. All through the book of Acts, God didn't create all the troubles they experienced. And Paul said, I've experienced plenty of troubles, persecutions and afflictions. But it wasn't, that wasn't what was leading Paul. That wasn't what was directing Paul. Again and again, he said, the Holy Spirit either forbade us or confirmed to us. The Holy Spirit is the one that is leading. Okay, people just don't know that. Revelation 6, 17. Um, I may not have time to, to get all this, so let me get into it. The verse, the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? All right, what time is that talking about? The great day of his wrath. It's not now. Now is not the great day of his wrath. Go to Revelation 7, 1 through 14. I don't have time to read all this. But the wrath of God, the, the, this is the four horsemen. This is the uh, pouring out of the uh, seals and the vials. And right in the middle of chapter 7, uh, it says that there's 144,000 of the tribes of Israel. These are 144,000 Jewish evangelists on fire for God, preaching the gospel to the world in the middle of the tribulation period. Now, here we go. Church has already been raptured in heaven, Revelation 4. And John said, Sir, who are these people? He said, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There are multitudes. Look at, um, uh, let's go back to verse 9. I beheld a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people. Everybody today is looking for a revival in America. I, I can't find any scripture that confirms a revival in America, but I can find scripture concerning a revival in the world from all nations. And that happened right at the end of the great tribulation period. Join me next time. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection, and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.